welcome to Shadow of Truth with your host, Dave Pransler from InvestmentResearchDynamics.com and Rory Hall from TheDailyCoin.org. And today is Thursday, August the 25th, 2016. And this is the Thursday market update. And we certainly appreciate everybody being here. Thank you so much. Yeah, one of the, what I, I, I think what I'd like to talk about is the fact that we now have uh, at least two governments that are telling their citizens that they need to be getting prepared. Germany, a few days ago, came out and said that they're, they, they're telling their citizens that, that, they re, that they're going to be required to get uh, to have 10 days of food, water, and, and other supplies on hand, that they are telling their citizens to, to go and do this right now. And uh, Czechoslovakia just came out uh, in the last day or two and did the same thing. Said, you know, saw Germany's warning. I didn't see Czechoslovakia's. I, mean, well, I, just, I just found it this morning. What's the point of 10 days? You know, if you're going to do 10 days, you may as well do two months. Well, I mean, uh, it's 10 days is better than nothing. I mean, most people have, you know, maybe two days or three days worth of food in their home. And that's it. May, maybe as much as seven days, but not much outside of that. You're not going to, it's going to be a rare in, in the United States. Anyway, it's going to be a rarity that you find where people have more than, uh, about seven days of food in their house or any type of supplies, you know, outside of medical supplies that they have may have a 30, 60 or 90 day supply, but that's, that, that'll be about it. Well, you know, that brings up a point because, and I mean, it's nowhere in the mainstream media, nowhere, No. but kind of quietly things have gotten kind of heated up in the Ukraine Crimea area. Uh, it's 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 on the verge of of moving to the next level. Yeah, and it's not in the mainstream media at all. I mean, people in this country would have no idea. And also, I saw and I didn't I didn't follow up on the story, but I saw that Turkey moved tanks into Syria. Yep. And, and I don't know if they are doing it on their own or if they're allied with the U.S. or allied with Russia. Again, I didn't really have time to follow up on it, but I think Syria's heating up again. And also, um, and I haven't seen a reference to it this week, but I saw a couple references to it last week. The conflict in the South Seas between China and the U S is heated up. Well, that's what we talked about last, last time on our la on Monday. Right. Well, I mean, to me that, you know, there's a reason why Germany came out and issued that warning to its exactly. citizens. That's exactly right. Because oh. it, it, things are starting to spiral out of control. And yes. The interesting part is, is that um, in Germany, is um, a few days after I, I published this article, a gentleman from from Germany, a German citizen, sent me an email saying that this this program has been in place for about ten years. That they've required people to to have you know ten days or more of of supplies on hand. That that's been in place for approximately ten years. And he said, "What?" What makes it interesting is that they're making this announcement while the German army is now conducting terror exercises with local police. And he said that that's illegal, just like it's illegal here in the United States. They're not supposed to be doing that, although they do. It goes against the Constitution in Germany, just like it does here in the United States. But he found that to be rather interesting and, and I found one article about it on a website called uh, DW.com, which I've never heard of. And it was, it reads kind of like a mainstream media outlet, but they, they talked about, you know, they put their typical uh, soft sell on it that, you know, there's no, no big deal. They're just doing, they're just conducting these exercises and so forth and so on. But they did confirm that it is actually happening. So you've got everything that you just described as far as Ukraine, Syria, and South China Sea. And that is a backdrop with Germany and now Czechoslovakia coming out and saying, okay, everybody, something, something is, is bad. <laughs> so you need to have... 
some you need to have your supplies in place right now starting right now i mean that's that's pretty telling to me well yeah and who knows i mean it again it's it's hopefully it's just you know this is a just in case thing but i mean it, it you, you know these things slowly escalate it it's i like to reference the hemingway description of how you go bankrupt <laughs> slowly than suddenly exactly and that's the way these things kind of kind of start you know they it's it happens slowly than suddenly well I, I mean you can go back and look at what happened in germany i mean as far as you know all through oh. the 20s they put into place you know one little step and another little step and another little step and then the next thing you know you have a totally or an absolute totalitarian government which is exactly what's happening here in the United States. We just take a little piece here and a little piece there, and another little piece, and next thing you know, you got cops at the end of the at the end of your block. So. Right, and again, I, I think a lot of it is is reflective of the fact that the U.S. is losing control of the of the system economically, really, and politically. I mean, if anything, what's going on with this current election? is that we have a massive political breakdown going on in this country. Yes, we do. And speaking of which, Nigel Farage uh, gave a uh, speech last night at a Donald Trump rally in Jackson, Mississippi. And there was about 10,000 people there. And, and it, it was an unbelievable speech. I mean, I, I love Nigel Farage. First of all, he's he's one of my heroes. I mean, he really is. And he he told them flat out that that the little people, the ordinary citizens, can rise up and beat the banksters and multinationalism. Look at what we did with Brexit. And he said, in light of everything, of all the people coming out and telling us that there's going to be world war if we do this, that our economy is going to crash, and even sending in uh, that guy, Barack Obama, uh, to tell us, you know, to talk down to us and to tell us that we need to stay in place and to remain in, in the European Union. And the morning, and I didn't even realize this, he said that the morning of the vote, that there was a poll that came out that said that they were down, that the Brexit vote was losing by 10%, and they still won. They still I won. remember that. I mean, it's, it's the same type of propaganda technique that it, that the Clinton campaign used in California. I mean, they, they planted a story in AP the night before the election that it said Hillary's got it won. So not only, and, and actually a, a lot of the polls before that had shown that Bernie Sanders was in front of Hillary. Yes. Yeah. And I think that basically a lot of people probably just didn't go out and vote in the primary. They're like, what's the point? You know, my guy's going to lose. It's, it's a joke. I mean, the whole thing is just, has just become just this sad reality TV program that's, it's hard to take. That's right. And, you know, I think a lot of it is just reflective of the fact that the underlying economy is starting to collapse and they, there's nothing they can do about it. I mean, this crap with the housing market, you know, those new home sales, you know, other than other than the permabulls out there who believe any of the headlines that they read, you know, that new home sales number was completely not credible. And I wrote two articles on my blog that dissected it and, and showed why. Yep. And you know, I mean, I'm just, if I just look at what I see around Denver, I mean, the existing home inventory is really starting to pile up and there's, there's a stretch that I drive every day. And these are, these are fairly high end homes across from, I guess you'd call it Denver's version of Central Park. And in a 10 block stretch, there's 12 homes on the market. One's already reduced its price by 15%. And there's, wow. there's, there's, a, you know, a big townhome for lease. And I've never seen that many homes for sale along that stretch. And that includes 2008 when it got really bad here. Well, I'd say we're on the verge of, of that of housing, housing bubble 2.0 collapsing. It's collapsing now. 
especially, I mean, I, I, you know, the thing of it is I get a lot of comments and emails from readers around the country and they're all telling me they, they're seeing the same exact thing in, in their part of the country. And it, what, as it turns out, um, there's a guy named Mark Hansen who does really cutting edge work. He mostly focuses on California, but he's, he knows the housing market inside and out. And he, he basically went through and showed how they used their quote unquote seasonal adjustments to turn 4,000 extra homes that were supposedly sold in the South. And they, and they seasonally adjusted it. And that turned into 72,000 more homes from, for July versus June. And then when you annualize that, it turns into 144,000 more homes year over year. I mean, it's just absurd. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, and it's all this, this statistical manipulation. And the thing of it is, the government can, can, can tell fairy tales about what's going on in the economy, but they can't control what's really happening on the ground. And that's part of what we're seeing with this uprise in violence in Chicago, places like Chicago, Milwaukee, Baltimore. I mean, you, you got, you know, the, the lower middle class. And I think they're really starting to feel the pressure of, of a deteriorating economy. They are starting to live it. That's right, the exactly. Problem. That's right. And, and the lies don't work because, you know, I can look out my window and I see... You know, I've got the TV on in one eye, and I've got reality you know, flooding in in the other eye, and the two don't match right. at all. And a perfect example of a lie that the government tells. You know, Obama came out at the end of the last fiscal year for the government, and he said, oh, we only had a, a $450 billion spending deficit this year. And I went and I looked at the increase in Treasury debt, and the, and the Treasury debt increased by over a trillion dollars. Now... The two numbers don't add up because if they were, if the spending deficit was only four hundred and fifty billion dollars, why did they have to borrow another trillion dollars in debt? See, and exactly. it's the, the, these accounting gimmicks that let them pretend that, or tell the public that the deficit was only four hundred and fifty billion dollars when, in reality, they borrowed over a trillion more dollars than was outstanding the year before. So that tells you that the government spent over a trillion more dollars. Than they, than they had coming in in revenue. So the real deficit was over a trillion dollars. And most of that's going to off-the-books programs like, um, what do they call them, black book military operations. Black, uh, black budget. Yeah, black budget military operations and, and other things like that. Well, I mean, I, I still think that uh, maybe we should call upon the Pentagon and say uh, we would like our 6.5 trillion dollars back that you can't find maybe uh maybe we should cut your budget by 6.5 trillion dollars over the next few years and see how that works out for you until we uh, that'll that. never happen i I, mean, I understand that yeah. but i mean <laughs> you know i mean if, if these guys want to play these you call them accounting gimmicks i call it fraud and it's and that's all that it is i mean it's theft by way of fraud that these guys are able to get away with. And, and most of the, not most, but the American people that are coming out in droves to Trump's rallies and that were coming out in droves to Bernie Sanders rallies are beginning to see that they see it for different reasons and in, in a different light, but they see that the lies and the manipulation are are very real and they're sick of it. That's right. So, so why don't we circle around to the gold market? Let's do the gold market. As you've, as you've been saying, Dave, and I want to, I want to give you the credit that you're due. Uh, you and I've, you, you sent me several emails this week and I'm greatly appreciative of that showing, uh, how, the, the demand for physical is completely off the chart on a global scale, and including that article, uh, it was published through Reuters, but it was about the Indian smuggling of gold, and that really blew me away. It, it seriously, I, I couldn't hardly believe what I was reading, but I'll let you uh, take it from here. Well, and the, the Indian, the smuggling into India has been going on for, I think, since 
2014, when the government put in the 10% import duty, they came out and they, they basically said our balance of payments is going negative we, we, because of the, all the gold we're importing, so we're going to put in an extra 10% import duty on gold. And that basically curtailed imports considerably into China. However, it opened up the avenue for smuggling because the smuggling can be extremely profitable. I mean, if you're talking about smuggling tons of gold in and you're getting paid, the, the market price of gold in India is about a hundred over a hundred dollars an ounce over the over the world spot price. Okay, and then you add on top of that the import duty, and that's what an Indian pays for gold. But if if it gets smuggled in, they're only paying the hundred, you know, hundred, hundred and twenty dollars over the spot price. But if you're a smuggler, you're buying you're sourcing bars at the spot spot price and you're smuggling it into India. And you're getting paid on a ton of gold. That's you know this round numbers call it thirty five thousand ounces of gold in a in a in a ton or whatever it is. And you're getting paid a hundred dollars a ton on top of that, you know, or a hundred dollars an ounce. That's a lot of money just to smuggle it in. And you're probably getting paid less than that. You're probably not getting the full hundred. So well, and that still, that's still a lot of money, right? And the articles that I had been reading. Again, most of them are, are sourced in this John Brimlow gold jottings newsletter that we get. It's it's very expensive, but it's it's for anyone who's a gold market professional. I don't know how you can operate without it. So and and so the public, but you know, most gold people don't see that. They they see the the GFMS numbers or they see uh, the World Gold Council numbers, and the World Gold Council just looks at official numbers. They don't even take into account smuggling. And same thing in China. The World Gold Council only looks at the numbers that are reported as being exported from Hong Kong into China. And that's the only number they look at. They don't consider the gold that goes into China through Beijing and Shanghai. But at any rate, as that article sh stated that I showed you earlier this week, the, an, a, an insider in India is saying there's at least 300 tons on an annualized basis right now being smuggled into India. Yep. And so if you look at the World Gold Council and you look at their numbers and you might say, wow, gold going into India is down 50% this year. Well, in fact, it's not. <laughs> it's about the same <laughs> as it was last year or two years ago, which means it's going at about a 1,000 ton run rate. Which is a, a very significant amount of gold. That's right. And the other thing the World Gold Council doesn't take into account are the Doré bars that go into India. Now, the, the premium for Doré bars isn't quite enough, isn't quite high enough right now for or the, the premium to world gold isn't quite high enough now for the Dore bars to be imported in any kind of great quantity but um, in the first half of this year there was a, a lot of Dore bars going on it's it's what it is is it's it's uh, I forget what they call them rogue rogue mines in Africa or something and and they and they take the Dore bars that are produced at the mines and they ship them to India and it, it bypasses the import duty and that's that's not an illegal shipment it just by the Dore bars aren't refined down to LBMA global marketing standard bars so so they they escape the import duty over there and they're they're basically about 80% pure and then they get refined further down but for for probably the first half of the year the Dore bars were making up for a large portion of the official bars that were not being imported because of because of the strike that was going on by the jewelers for over the excise tax and plus the size of the import duty. So, I mean, the net net of it is my guess is that, you know, if you consider Dore bars plus smuggled gold, I'm sure India has been importing, you know, about the same run rate that they've been importing over the last couple of years, which is about a thousand tons plus or minus. Sounds about right to me. And, the one thing that the World Gold Council in their latest report that I found significant was the fact that there's a lot more scrap gold coming back into the market with, the, with gold being as high as it is, which is still very cheap. Uh, they're seeing a, a, a major uptick in the volume of scrap gold coming back in into the market, which it'll be interesting to see how that plays out uh, at the end of the year, according to their manipulated uh, numbers. 
we all yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, again, the scrap gold, the, the, the recycled gold, it's, it's again, that, to me, that's not, at the margin, that doesn't set this, the price. No, I understand, but it's, yeah. but it, it just, it, it's going somewhere. Right. Somebody's using it. Now, what's interesting about this latest takedown in the metals, and I think a big part of it was, it was keyed towards the um, September silver futures options expiration today, and I had been looking at the put call structure on September silver futures all week, and the way that it was set up, there was a big chunk of puts on September silver futures outstanding at 1850, and I had been emailing with Bill Murphy, aka Midas, all week, and I said, look, they're keying this off of this big chunk of puts that are out there, and if you assume that the bullion banks were the writers of those puts, it would they don't want silver to close below 1850 on Thursday. And it looks like that's probably where we're headed. Right now, September silver is at 1856. And I think part of the gold smack, you know, and again, this is that stupid Jackson Hole conference this week. And you had a bunch of the Fed guys come out this week and say, oh, we're, you know, September's a live meeting. We're going to raise rates in September, we promise, which they won't. But that's, that's kind of had a negative power, cast a negative power on gold. And they always hit gold in the last two weeks of August. They always do. It's the weakest, it's the weakest time of the year seasonally for physical demand. It's the slowest time on Wall Street. You know, so the, the trading volume is extremely low. It's very easy for them to push the market around this week. And they always do it ahead of Jackson Hole because you can't have the price of gold going higher when all these Federal Reserve superstars are meeting in Jackson Hole to discuss the future of the universe. But yeah. um, said so another was, way to, to determine the fate of, of our lives. <laughs> right. But silver was threatening $19 on Tuesday pretty, pretty significantly. And it actually hit 1898 Tuesday night. And we wake up yesterday and they just annihilated the price of gold. And I think what they did there is they were having trouble getting, they, they didn't want silver to close over 19. And I think that what they did is they hit the price of gold because they knew, and it happened at 8.40 Eastern time yesterday. I, I think they knew that all the, the hedge fund algos that are keyed on the gold-silver ratio once the price of gold went down enough, they would start coughing up silver futures. And I think that's essentially what we saw yesterday. I mean, it's just it just shows how highly manipulated and orchestrated this market is. But it also shows that, in general, they're having trouble getting it to go a lot lower. And, I, again, I think what they're doing right now is just trying to control the upside. And this is one of the weeks when it's easiest. Now, the interesting thing about the smackdown in gold is that the, the price of gold in – in India, if it if it goes down enough, it's going to start triggering imports over there, and we may actually start seeing that later this week. And you know, this is a natural time of India to start importing a lot of gold. So whether it gets smuggled in, or whether it's via dore bars that have to get further refined down, or whether they take advantage of this manipulated hit on the price of gold, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more gold being reported as going into India probably starting either next week or shortly after Labor Day. Yeah, I mean, because like you said, this is this is their time of year this is when all their uh, festivals begin and wedding season starts and so forth. I mean, a lot of activity uh, centered around gold between now and then, about March, something like that, like um, February, March. It goes, it, it goes basically from early September to mid-December or maybe early December, and then it, then it shuts down for a couple months. Well, it doesn't shut down, but it tails off. And then it picks up again, yeah, like say mid to late March, maybe early April, and goes to um, mid-May. Mid okay. So, um, and you used to be able to trade around that because before, before China was a known presence as a massive gold importer, um, so let's just say, say pre-2008, pre 2009, you could always see gold go down in July and August, and then it would always go up from September to December in general. And then it would sell off again, say from mid-January through late February, and then it would start rallying again until mid-May. And then, on, you know, in the summer everyone goes away, and of course they, the paper manipulators would go to work. But China's kind of smoothed that process out a little bit. 
I'd say they'd smooth it out quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, with the exception of this year, the People's Bank of China has been, you know, the last year anyway, they, they've really changed that whole dynamic. Them and uh, between uh, People's Bank of China and, and the uh, Central Bank of Russia, I mean, both of those entities, I mean, they aren't, they aren't messing around. And as you no. pointed out the other day, uh, Dave, in, in an uh, offline conversation that you and I were having, that Vietnam has been uh, piling in quite a bit of gold uh, over the past past year or so. Yes, they were quiet for a couple of years, and all of a sudden now commentary on Vietnam has started showing up again in, in John Brimlow's newsletters. And they're, they're quietly the fifth largest gold importer in the world, and most people probably don't know that. I mean, I didn't know that until I started reading his newsletter about 10 years ago. I mean, that's, that's significant. And, yes. and, and I feel confident that they will, that Vietnam is going to be uh, along the new Silk Road or the One Belt, One Road project. And quite possibly, I'll have to go back and look, uh, involved in either the SCO or the EEU or a combination thereof. I mean, it's, it's, it's an important manufacturing center also. Yes, I mean, it's they. They have a lot. They have a lot more going on over there than, than just a, a war that that we inflicted upon them. You know, fifty <laughs> years ago. That's true. It's a, it's a very important economy. They um, also make great food. There's there's a Vietnamese community in Denver, and some of the some of the best ethnic restaurants are in the area where where they live. See now you're just bragging. <laughs> We don't have that down here in Nashville. Now, if you want some good cornbread, I can tell you exactly where to go. <laughs> Which would be my mom's house. <laughs> yeah, well, you get good barbecue down there, something we don't get in Denver. Well, that's true. Uh, well, Dave, have we uh, given them enough to chew on for the weekend? I think so. Well, all right. Well. No, you got a lot going on, and so do I. So I guess we'll end it there and pick it up on Monday and uh, see where we stand. That sounds good to me. Have a good weekend. You too, bud. Thanks. Bye.